Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Got it. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Bracha Batsmira Vishlomo. I am your teacher today. We are going to take a basic overview of Roman garb circa the first century. Um, I'm from the East Kingdom, and my primary persona is a Jewish Roman woman in the first century. I am going over things in a very basic overlook manner. This is so that you can have an intro to Roman garb if you're looking for something maybe a little easier, some camp garb, maybe you're just curious about Roman, maybe you're going to Penzik and you don't want to die during the daytime. Um, so while Roman can be very, very fancy and fanciful, the takeaway that I would like everybody to have here is that it can be simple and it is beginner friendly as well as very intricate. Um, so you can do uh, do this sort of garb at multiple levels, and I don't want you to be afraid of it. So that is why I am wearing very basic, no makeup, no frills Roman today. Don't be scared. This is beginner friendly. You can get started and you can take it as fancy as you want to go. I am going to now share my PowerPoint. Let's do this. So this is first century lookbook. That's That's what we're looking at over here. So thing to know about Roman garb versus later period garb is they were primarily dealing with straight seams if you're dealing with seams at all. We are not talking about a garment that is cut to shape. We are talking about garments that are shaped with pleating and folding and then belting it into place. So while primarily you're not looking at many seams, some garments were sewn. Lower class, actually you're looking at things like tea tunics, but the most accurate version is taking some lightweight wool or linen that is already a tube, pinning it at the shoulders, belting it, and off you go. Um, so all the sort of beautiful flowing shapes that we see on statuary of, of kings, queens, and gods and goddesses, you're primarily looking at things that were shaped, draped, and pinned, sewn, or buttoned into place. Um, so you're looking at comparatively simple structures, and that means that the primary measurements to keep in mind for your body are your widest circumference, wherever that is, and the length of your stride so that you can walk comfortably. Um, historically, you are not looking at slit garments. You can put a slit in your garment if you want. I'm not the guard police. You can do that if you want. Um, but if you want to be as accurate as possible, you're looking at basically a tube that is pinned or buttoned. Um, modern fabrics, however, are not woven in the round the way Roman garments sometimes were. When you go to Joann's or Fabric.com or wherever you get your linens or wools, etc., you're getting a flat fabric cut off of a bolt, which means you're going to be sewing at least one seam. This is not a horrible anachronism. You're not you're not creating some some grave sin against the Roman garb gods, this is okay. Um, but you probably would want to avoid, you can see the cat over there. Um, you probably want to avoid um, piecing too many things together. Piecing is period, but you'll probably want to stay away from that as much as possible when it comes to Roman garb in particular. We're gonna first look at what Roman women wore versus what Roman men wore. Um, this is a very gendered binary presentation. I apologize for that. There doesn't seem to be a lot of um, deviation from that particular norm based on the materials I had access to. Uh, so that is that is the only thing I can say. You should dress according to your gender identity as you feel. Please do not feel boxed in. Um, primarily, Roman women wore three layers and anything less than that was a bit improper. Um, even during work, as we will see when we examine some frescoes. The primary layer is going to be the undergarment layer, kind of the equivalent to a chemise or an undershirt. You have the tunica intima, the most intimate garment. This is the one that goes on your skin. You're looking at plain, unbleached, uh, bleached and or undyed, very basic stuff. So that would be usually wool or linen. Silk was available in the Roman Empire via trade, but they only stole silkworms from China in about the fourth century. So you didn't have a lot of access to silk in a domestic market. Um, then after that, you would have what is the equivalent of a dress layer, the stola or uh, tunica, which is the pretty colors where the pretty colors come in. And finally, you would wrap yourself in a veil. It is called a pala. That is a Latin word for cloak. I am not wearing one, but I do have one behind me so that you can see. This would go around my body. It would probably constrict my ability to use my arms properly, and it would cover my head. Uh, Roman women veiled their heads 
um, in various manners. You would tie something around your head, you would use the paula as a head wrap. Going around bareheaded was not something that adult women particularly did outside of the house. If you were younger and unmarried, like below the age of 14, you could get away with a little more. Um, I am wearing gap sleeves right now, um, but sleeves could be sewn fully shut. It did get cold in the winter in the Italian peninsula. Long sleeves were not unknown to the Romans. Um, they know how to sew, so you would have that available as well. Um, what do you wear underneath all your dress layers? Underwear, right? Roman underwear is surprisingly modern looking, uh, and we would recognize it immediately as an undergarment. Um, this is a little bit post my period. This is um, from uh, a few centuries on, um, and these are depicting women athletes. And you can see that they're basically wearing what we would probably identify as bikinis. They're wearing some sort of bra and some sort of underwear. It, it's very obvious that these are the undergarments that would be worn. Um, they're stripped down to the undergarments for athletic wear. Um, and you can see how uh, there's somebody with a, a leaf of victory, a crown of laurels of victory. So, so there's a lot going on here, but we, we really, as modern people examining history, immediately recognize what's going on when we look at this bikini girls mosaic. Um, this is a first century le leather thong, and you can see its relationship with the fresco that we just saw. And it's made from a single piece of leather. You tie it on the sides. Um, when this was recovered from the river, it had stretching on it that indicated that this leather had been worn. This was a piece that was used. It wasn't a display piece. It wasn't, it wasn't a test item. Like this was, this was an item that was used in someone's life. Um, I don't necessarily recommend leather bikini bottoms under your garb unless you want to, um, but I want you to know that from the skin out, you do have a lot of options that we would recognize immediately as modern underwear that holds and supports the way modern underwear would. Um, just wanted to let you know that. Um, so we have gone through the three layers of what a woman would wear. This is from a Pompeii fresco. We are going to look at a lot of frescoes from Pompeii because it was destroyed by, um, by a volcanic eruption in, late, later in the first century. So it's a really excellent time capsule about what the Romans were, were seeing, drawing, and viewing themselves and each other. And you can see if you on this fresco that you have a young woman with her hair bound up. She has three layers. You can see this sort of sheer white over here. You mm. can see this yellow garment that's sort of falling off her shoulder. And you can see a wrap around her. That would be the Paula that is just sort of falling off of her. Um, I, you will notice that she has bare feet. A lot of times when you're looking at bare feet, you are not looking at a depiction of a real person. You are looking at a depiction of someone who is supernatural, a hero or a god or something of that status. You as a normal non-deity <laughs> would wear shoes of some sort, which we will cover a little bit later on. Um, also, she has a beautiful golden headband. There's a couple different interpretations of what that may be. We will also cover jewelry a little later. Um, this is another... Uh, fresco and I think that you can get a lot of information off of this um, so you can see here that this woman in the front and center she has her hair only somewhat bound she has these pretty fashion little tendrils so you can start to see hairstyles that were in use in the first century you can see that she has a pretty high neckline and these sleeves are long because you can see that there's either what may be a bracelet or a hem down here and you can see the same sort of stripey ish texture and what may be a bracelet or a hem on her other arm as well you can see that her dress her paula her cloak is wrapped all the way around her how she's holding it up on her on her arm arm here we go um and you can see the other room behind her are dressed similarly you are looking at multiple layers and each time even though we're in, in the interior, you can see that they have these three layers. This one has her hair bound, even though she's inside the house or it would have been more appropriate to go with her hair covered or uncovered as she may have seen fit. Um, and you can also see that the Romans used a lot of color. We're used to going to museums and seeing these, these pale white marble statues, but historically those would have been painted. And Roman life was full of color. Roman fabrics were full of color. But what I want you to also notice is that Roman fabrics are not full of patterns. You'll get stripes every now and then, but you're not going to get, you know, fabric painting all over the place the way we may see in other cultures and other periods. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, this is one of my absolute 
favorite frescoes. It's been partially restored, you can kind of tell. And this is dressing of what may be a bride or a priestess. And what I really love about it is just how vibrant it is. And you can, once again, see the sheer underlayer and you can see that there's a Paula wrapping. You can see there's layers here of, of her stola and her tunica. Um, you can see here on the far left how one of the attending maidens has has a binding underneath that's, that's holding one of the inner layers together. And you can also see some stripes on this woman's Paula where she is sitting sort of enthroned over watching everything. Her hair is only partially covered. Um, you can see some beautiful jewelry. You can see that her Paula over here, this cloak wrap around her, shifts from this blue to uh, sort of pinkish white. Um, and I'm mm -hmm. not sure if what you're depicting, if what is being depicted here, excuse me, is fabric that was woven in two different colors with a border or hemming. And we don't have extent garments to examine whether a hem was sewn on or whether these different things were woven on. And you can see for this woman who is being attended to, her hair is being done by what may be another priestess or her mother. You can see at the very bottom, there's a darker purple on a paler purple dress. Um, this is the gap sleeved tunica dress that she is wearing. And again, that looks very beautiful and intimate. You can see some some designs that are picked out at the bottom of the hem. But I cannot tell you if this was a design woven into the fabric or a hem that was sewn on. We are reenactors. We get to make that choice in our modern depictions. Um, I suspect that this was woven or painted, but you don't have to take my word for it. You get to make that choice as a reenactor yourself. You want to slap some trim on your tunica? Go wild. I support you. Uh, <laughs> so I, that was a lot of words about hems. <laughs> um, this is also a mosaic from Pompeii. This is actually depicting actors in a play. Um, and the reason I put it in here is because the previous mosaics showed us a lot of gap sleeves, short sleeves, but we haven't seen long sleeves. And I wanted to show you that all three of the women here are wearing long sleeves. You don't get a sleeve that looks kind of fitted like that without sewing it. It's not some sort of like wide baggy trumpet sleeve. Like these are sleeves that are attached to the garment. Um, and you can see again, they're all wearing some sort of wrap of the Paula around their outfits. Um, this uh, grotesquery mask indicates that the, um, the role of the woman in this play is uh, some sort of diviner or seer. Um, also, I think that it's worth pointing out that while you have, again, this sort of striped pattern showing up in the Paula, where you really see fabric patterns are not on the clothes that people are wearing but on the fabrics that they're sitting on, on these pillows and drapery over their stools and their chairs. So pattern fabrics have their role in Roman society, but you don't see them depicted on people. You see it depicted on items that people used. Um, I do suspect that this green and pink that we see on the cirrus over here is the artist depicting light and shadow and not depicting stripes because they're not even. And you can see over here on the drapery as well. Um, again, this is free to any interpretation. If you decide that you're seeing stripes and you wanna make a stripey tunica, please go ahead. This is, this is what we do as modern interpreters of ancient art and culture. Um, so some tips and tricks. You can decide to sew your closure shut or you can pin them using fibula, um, which are, I have some to show you which are basically the equivalent of safety pins. I got these from Thor Thor's Hammer. You can get them on Etsy. Um, he vends at Penzik and I'm sure a bunch of other wars as well. And he sells them in multiple sizes. But this is a very typical example of the kind of historic safety pin you would use to pin your clothing shut. You would just put it right here on the seams, pin it shut and off you go. Um, I cheat. I sew them shut and then pop a button on top because I can't be bothered to pin my clothing every time I want to go out to the marketplace and get dressed. Um, you can have a gap sleeve like I'm wearing right now, or you cannot. You can sew it completely shut. Um, you can have long sleeves. You can have short sleeves. Um, I do recommend that in terms of fabric, you want to stick to cotton if you can access it, even if it's not the most accurate, just because it's accessible and it's a natural fiber. Linen and wool um, were primarily used during the first century. I'm wearing uh, garments made out of cotton gauze and uh, the my tunica intima is made out of cotton voile that I got from imported from India on eBay because it's light and because I can afford it. So don't be afraid to make choices that are friendly to your wallet. 
stick with that. If you have silk, um, that's cool. Be aware that it wasn't as common in the first century as it was a little later on once the Romans got their own silkworms and started domestic productions. If you are just starting out and you want to experiment with your own bed sheets that you got from a dollar from your local Dollar Tree, do it. Absolutely do it. It is 100% kosher. I give you permission. This is this is some of the best types of garments to, to do that is sort of experimentation with. Um, also, the, the, you might have fun dyeing them. Experiment, experiment around. Um, there is a really cool video that I would like to show you about making rosettes on gap sleeves. There's a couple of different ways that you can have that very attractive sort of gap sleeve. And one way of doing that is by gathering the fabric, sewing it, and making it into what looks like a little rosette. I'm going to click the link. We are going to watch it together and uh, I'm going to mute myself for that. Can everybody hear the video? No. no. We're not getting no. audio, unfortunately. Not hearing audio. Yeah, That's you have to share audio as well as share screen. There's, there's no sound. How do I share audio as well as my screen? There's no sound to the video. Hmm. I apologize. Give me one moment. Can... It, it should be at the top of the screen that you're sharing. There is no sound on purpose. It looks like that did not work either. That is unfortunate. Well, we can probably watch it without the sound for a little bit and I can narrate what she's doing, but I'm so sorry. I don't, I don't really understand why this is not audio. I apologize. Maxim, Maxima is saying that there's no sound on purpose. Ah, okay. So here you can see that she has hemmed it and what she's doing is she's crunching the fabric together to make a little bunch. She's going to take her needle and thread and she's going around that little gather and then she will sew through it. The process is very, very simple. Um, and when you're done with it, you get that little sort of fabric button. And this helps gather the fabric really beautifully. It helps create a beautiful drape on your gap sleeve. So you can walk around looking like a Roman mosaic out of Pompeii. Um, and it's all easily done by hand. And you just stab it through a few times to secure it. And that's it. You have made a little rose button. If this is your first time doing Roman, if you've never done Roman, you may want to avoid this and just pin your fabric and go. But um, when I say that this is a type of garb that is friendly to newcomers, but also friendly to experts, this is kind of what I mean. There's a lot of different options for embellishment and, and mimicking what we see on statues and, and frescoes to various degrees. She's just anchoring that there right now. And that's it. All done. Awesome. And then we do actually have a question from the chat. If Absolutely. Would... And then Lissa wanted to know, would the fibula be worn decoratively on a sewn seam or... Um, I probably, I, I don't know either way because I, I, abs I accidentally turned off my own video. Um, I don't know either way for sure. Hold on. Pause share. There we go. I don't know for sure because I don't have access to extent garments. Um, and that is, that is the hang up on, fi on finding that out for sure. Um, I suspect yes because we know that certain seams were sewn. We, we know that people did sew seams. There's no reason why they wouldn't. Um, we do see a lot of jewelry being worn in the Roman Empire. Um, so there's no reason why they 
wouldn't do what we did. Um, let me get back to the slideshow because there is more. I managed to close out of it because I am very technologically adept to everybody. My apologies. We're going to get right back into that. You're doing great. Don't worry. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, I again stress that there's only so much that we can really learn from what are ultimately our secondary sources. Um, these these paintings and these statues, these these mosaics, what they are is contemporaneous, right? They're they're from the era that we're talking about. I, I dug up a bunch of sources primarily from the first century to show you this first century lookbook. But what we don't have are the garments themselves. And that kind of question is a real brain teaser because we don't have access to the garments themselves. And let's share screen number two. Here we go. Um, there is a second video. Hopefully the sound will work on this one um, because I wanted to show you somebody making the whole outfit from scratch. So you can kind of see how it's put together. Um, she skips a layer. Please work, please work, please work, please work. She does skip a layer. She only makes two layers. She makes the, the stola and she makes the pala, but she doesn't make the tunica intima. It's a fast forwarded video because I don't think anybody wants to watch me so. <laughs> the drape on her dress form because she wants it to drape a very specific way. I will also confess here in front of everyone in God that I am terrified of sewing machines. I sew everything by hand because I am a scaredy cat. And as you can see, she ties it on with a length of rope. So here she is just hemming what will be her pala. Um, so you'll notice that the garments that she's using are all single color. There doesn't seem to be a band of color um, on either side, the way we saw in some of the frescoes. Um, if you, I'm using a cotton sari as a pala, and this cotton sari has woven in a border. This isn't a border that I can just unstitch. Um, that's why I chose this cotton sari as a Paula. So you have a couple of options. She chose a solid color. I chose a woven in color. We didn't really discuss hairstyles um, because I haven't really studied hairstyles. She is doing a type of hairstyle that she's probably seen somewhere else. I keep my hair all up the way I have seen in the first century frescoes. 
Um, we've seen a couple of little tendrils hanging down, but we haven't seen a lot of women with their hair down. Um, so she and I have made certain stylistic differences and, ch and choices about how we portray Roman, but you can see where the through line is for all of them. Also, she shows some very epic music for her video. <laughs> Um, so yeah, that was pretty basic um, in terms of it was straightforward. There weren't any, there wasn't anything crazy or surprising going on. So if you need a last minute piece of garb, that is a great way to do it. Um, something that I pointed out and that I pointed out in the previous fresco is how people were binding using a waist binding of what looked essentially like rope. I am also using um, this tablet woven belt over here um, that a friend made for me. It's more accurate than the metal belts that I always liked. These, this is like a stretchy metal belt that I'll wear when I'm feeling fancy, but a woven belt is significantly um, more likely to be accurate than a metal belt, just embellishments. But the metal belt is shinier. No, I do not wish to wash this again. I wished to go forward into, here we go, into men's garb. We have now covered women's garb. Um, we are now going to talk about men's garb. No pants. <laughs> pants was something worn by those weird barbarians further up north. What are those weird leg tubes? We don't do that here. Um, so for men, a tunic and footwear is the basic garb. You can wear a cloak over it. Um, tunics can be longer or shorter, so that would depend on social status, wealth, or personal preference. You can wear it with a belt or unbelt it. You can blouse it over the belt for texture, but it would never be shorter than the knee no matter how you wore it. Um, what about togas? Togas were a thing, but not for very long. That was really formal garb reserved for citizens and certainly for the patrician class. At a certain point in time, um, some emperors tried to reimpose the toga as a sign of Roman citizenness, but people simply didn't want to wear them very much. So some fun facts about the toga. This was originally a garment for all genders, but it became a men's only garment after the second century BCE, so a couple of centuries before our first century lookbook. Um, after that, the only women who wore togas were women wearing a male garment and they were signaling that they were a prostitute. So that was not something that a woman would wear. The equivalent for a toga for women was the pala, the cloak wrap garment that we were that we saw on all those frescoes. Um, so female Roman citizens would wear a stola, but the garment was particularly bulky and they preferred other variants of tunica that were slightly less bulky. Um, the toga is a very large, expensive garment made of wool. It gets hot, it gets sweaty, and a lot of men simply didn't enjoy wearing them very much, so they weren't very popular. When you see frescoes or statues of someone wearing a toga, you're looking at somebody making a personal and political statement about their status and their place in society. They are depicting themselves to you as a certain kind of Roman, but they are not wearing it every day. It was, it was annoying. They didn't want to. Um, this is another fresco from Pompeii, and this is one of those darling slice of life frescoes that I that I absolutely adore. This is just some people buying bread. You see a family, a little, a little boy over here, and you can see that they're mostly wearing cloaks draped over something. This guy's not wearing, the baker's not wearing a uh, toga. He's, he's just wearing some plain white linens. It gets hot in that bakery. He's just doing his job. This is just a very darling slice of life little, it's almost like a photograph right? You just get a, a glimpse into what life was like back then. This, however, is a grave photo. Uh, this is a man and his wife, and you can tell that this is a very formal portrait. They're posed in a certain way. Her hair is done up. He is wearing a toga, and he's holding a scroll of state. So this is a very formal portrait. He's giving you a message about himself and his status in society versus the slice of life i'm buying bread with my little boy like these are completely different portraits and they're both from the same city they're giving you a different message and that's why the other ones are just wearing cloaks over tunics but this man this man is wearing a toga and that's telling you something this is a fresco of a soldier and you can tell that he's wearing boots armor tunic 
He's got a cloak that he's holding up. He's got his weapons. He's not wearing a toga. That would be inconvenient in battle. Um, the military set a lot of fashion trends for, for male fashion throughout the history of the Roman Empire. That kind of bleeds over uh, into the rest of society for very many centuries. Um, this is another slice of life little photo fresco. These are a bunch of men and they're drinking and playing games. And you can see a couple of different kinds of tunics worn here. You can see the one on the far right has a belt because his, his tunic is bloused over it. And you can see that it still covers his knees. Um, but his friend next to him wearing a yellow tunic is unbelted. But you can also see that there's some stripes running down on each side, there's some stripes. So he's a stripey boy. Uh, and then his friend with a cup and some sort of dice holder maybe, I'm not quite sure. He is wearing a red tunic and he has a yellow cloak draped over him. Uh, so, so you see a couple of variations here. Men did have fashion and they had color and they had opinions about it. Um, but they were also kind of the lucky few when it comes to wearing stripes. We didn't really see a lot of stripes on women unless they were on the hems of garments. Um, but men had stripes running vertically down their garments only sometimes, ultimately also derived from military fashion. So stripes are a thing. Um, men's tunics would usually have stripes that were vertically down three inches wide. Purple on white is the most common color combination, but you can have a lot of different color combinations. We just saw red on yellow, so we know that that was a thing. We just saw that we, it can be belted or unbelted. Um, we just saw that a lot of those men were wearing sleeves, but it could also be sleeveless and just like a little a little hole cut down with a slit for the, for the head and the neck. Um, they can be worn in layers or not, depending on personal preference and weather. So there's a lot of sumptuary options available for layering your Roman tunics, or you can just wear one as a work garment and off you go. So there's a lot of range of options here. Shoes. We have not really discussed shoes yet. No one wore heels. People wore sandals, but they also wore boots. Primarily, they were wearing low boots. Uh, the knee-high open gladiator style that we're so used to seeing from Hollywood or seeing on a lot of statuary, seen on some frescoes, that's usually associated with deities or extreme wealth. So the people wearing those kinds of inconveniently high-laced shoes are people who are showing off how much wealth that they have. Um, going barefoot wasn't really a thing. It's a little dangerous. It's kind of icky. Put on some shoes. You'll feel better, I promise. Um, you have a lot of options in terms of sandals. These are sandals, the um, Roman sandals that were recovered from the Thames. And just these three, you can see just what an incredible range of leatherworking was available in the Roman Empire and how much fashion you can display and how much wealth and, and, and expertise in leather tooling you can display on just your shoes. You can tell that these are all about the ankle length. They're not going very high. Um, and they weren't, they weren't very sturdy looking. These shoes would be worn for as long as they lasted and then you would chuck them away, perhaps throw them into the Thames and then make or purchase yourself another pair. And you would just wash, rinse, repeat throughout the lifetime of your feet. This isn't terribly unusual in comparison to other periods as well where you had soft soled leather shoes. Um, so this is clearly something that carries a through line throughout a lot of period. It's only really in later period where you start to see like little heels and other things that are added later on. Heels and heeled shoes or block things added to the bottom of your feet. Really a thing for the Roman Empire. Um, I am going to stop sharing because this is the end of my slideshow, but I do want to show you some Roman jewelry that I have. I didn't really include it in the slideshow. Um, I ran out of time to make it, um, but we have seen a lot of examples of jewelry on women as we have gone through this slideshow. And there's a couple of different options for you if you want to bling it up. Um, so simple rings like this, you have a plain thing and a gem in the middle, it can be real, it can be fake. This will pass muster as a Roman ring for, for a wide range of Roman history. You can get something like this online or for many vendors in the SEA. You can get it out of real material, you can get it out of brass and glass. It will work and it will, it will do very, very well for you. Um, you can get or make these cute little fibulae. Um, some of them are fancier than others. Um, this is one necklace that is false pearls and amber. It's quite pretty. 
and it's a very good Roman dupe. This was 20 bucks on the internet. So you don't have to break the bank to make yourself look like a statue or a fresco. Um, I will say that primarily Roman necklaces would hit where this one hits. That's why I wore this one today. So you can see where it drapes on the neck. It doesn't hang very far down. You're not looking at very long pendants. You're primarily looking at things that drape in the round. Um, not that pendants are unseen in the Roman Empire. They're there, but they're not, you know, hanging down to your belly button. They're usually they're usually hitting here and up. And on most statuary and frescoes that I personally have seen, I'm primarily seeing over here. Um, more earrings. We've seen a lot of earrings. Pearls are very popular in the Roman Empire. Um, the type of earrings have little danglies are called crotalia, which means rattle, because when the beads hit each other, they make a soft rattle sound. This sort of thing, if you can see it, I got this from Elegantly Eccentric. She is a fellow Skadian, and she makes and sells Roman jewelry. Um, so I got this from her. This is a reproduction. Um, so that is an option for you. But you can also just get, where is it? You can also just get plain little pearl hooks, just one pearl, and you hook it in. That is also accurate for the Roman Empire. I have it in this bag. We are going to turn this bag over so I can show you. Plain, very, just a very small little pearl dangle. That's also accurate. Um, this kind of closure isn't the most accurate, but who cares? No one's going to examine your ears. No one's going to do that to you. You can just wear your little pearls, and I promise you're going to look like you stepped out of a fresco. Um, so that is my Roman garb and jewelry overview. And we have 20 minutes left because I talked very, very fast and I kind of threw a lot of information at you. So please feel free to ask questions, grab some water, grab a drink. Um, let me know if you enjoyed it. And that's it. Thank you so much for stopping by. Awesome, awesome. And then we do have another question that did pop up in the chat while we were talking. Mm -hmm. And this one's from uh, Christina. For gap sleeves, how far should the gaps be between the connection points, or is it more of a personal preference? I have not found any magical formula. So I am currently saying personal preference. If I manage to examine enough frescoes and come up with more of a more of a method, I will I will let you know. Um, what I what I have seen is that you usually will get at least one, if not more, per upper arm. Um, so you could just have one big gap, but what I've seen a little more is to have like one, two, three down the arm. Again, that is that is a very rough guess on my end, so really this is more about personal preference. Awesome, awesome. Um, I see that there's another question down there. Yep, the necklines, are they always even or does the front scoop more? I think that depends on how you pin it. Um, for me, I happen to like to show off, so I'm going to stand up so you can see how I'm wearing. I sewed this and tacked it so that the front is wider than the back, so that when I held it evenly, the front would scoop more. Um, that is my personal preference, but I also have seen depictions where it's pretty even and it's kind of like a boat neck, and they just pin it right here, and, uh, and, and then off they go. So that is something that I have seen, but primarily in the frescoes that we've been looking at today, you do see a little bit of a roundness or a scoop in the neckline, and that depends on how and where you put the pins and how you want to adjust that. Some awesome. Oh, I neglected to show you all one thing. I am so sorry. We have seen a number of what look like golden headbands on a couple of these frescoes of the women um, from Pompeii, and uh, that is this item. It's basically like a headband. If you go on Etsy, a woman who has a shop called Wickedly Wired sells these. And I find they are the closest approximation to what the frescoes look like. And you just pop that on your head and it looks really pretty. And you can braid or lift your hair around it. It gives you that perfect thing. This one is the shortest one she sells. So you are guaranteed to never violate a kingdom sumptuary law. Um, but she makes them in a couple of different designs and heights, and I love them, and they're so pretty, um, and they're they're very fairly priced considering that they're handmade. But if you don't want to do that, you can do what I've been doing for years, and use a cheap headband from your local Claire's. These are 
leaves are very common and leaf designs are very common. You see them everywhere in Roman imagery, um, but you don't want to accidentally um, broadcast that you have a prize that you may not have. So I just picked something that looked like leaves from afar, but are actually feathers. And I have just absolutely just gone, boop, now I have a headband, the end. And uh, again, this is, this is intro to Roman garb, not how can I, not necessarily how you can be the most accurate, but how you can get a very accurate look without making yourself too crazy or too broke. This is the more broke option. This is the $3 option. <laughs> so both will work, I promise. Awesome, awesome. And then we did have another question pop up. For the dress layer, what is the difference between the tunica and the stola? That is primarily about how large the stola is. Um, the stola was a, a type of tunic style dress and that you're still talking about straight seams, but it was bloused over multiple times and it kind of would make you feel like the Hindenburg. It was many, <laughs> and you blouse it up and then you pull it over again. Um, so there was a lot more fabric. Um, so you, it certainly indicated wealth and status, um, especially for a married woman in particular. Um, an unmarried 14-year-old girl is not the person who's wearing the stola. The matron of a certain class and wealth status would wear the stola. But that's a lot of fabric, and it gets really hot, and it takes a lot to, like, put it on, and then you blouse it over, and then you belt it again, and then you blouse it over again, and then you feel like you look like a balloon. So, kind of like the, the toga, um, they didn't really want to wear it anymore, so they stopped. Awesome, awesome. Um, again, great. also, I um, would like to just let you know that there are other people who will interpret the stola differently than I have. That's okay. You know, don't, if, if you decide that I am wrong about that, that's also okay. I am still learning. We're all still learning. And um, that is the conclusion I have come to right now. Uh, I, I do not have a PhD in Roman studies. I have a bachelor's in archaeology. So I reserve the right to be wrong and change my mind and give this topic later with updated information. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Then you have two more questions that came in. Uh, first, you were talking about the lack of, of printed patterns. Mm -hmm. How is it... How about tech, like textural? And the reason it, that it's brought up is the person was noticing that you had textured stripes on your stola. And then the second question is, should the tunica intima be sleeveless? And The tunica or... intima can be sleeved or sleeveless as the weather or personal preference dictates. Because we have seen both iterations in the frescoes that we have examined today. Um, so I have a full sleeved tunica, but I am very warm right now. So I wore uh, one that has short sleeves with gaps in it because it is more comfortable to me personally. Um, this fabric came from Penzik and I got it for $15 and then I made the garment by hand at war. So I wore it because I'm proud of it. But you'll notice, um, I'm going to like get real close to the camera here. You'll notice two things. One, it has stripes. I have not seen this kind of stripes on any fresco. This is an anachronism. What I really like about it though, is that it has texture. And the texture, we don't really see that depicted in the frescoes, but that doesn't mean it wasn't there. We know that Rome had a fantastic trade network all the way to China. And we know that they imported a lot of rich things, fabric included. We know that weaving patterns and colors into fabric was certainly a, a well-known and used technology at the time. I think it would be very plausible to have textured patterns. One of my other uh, tunica dresses has solid color but a sort of texture to to the fabric itself and i made it with that fabric because of that conjecture specifically because of that conjecture um so there you go um there is there's a little bit of anachronism in what i'm wearing right now also the fact that my head is not covered is absolutely not appropriate but you know we're indoors so it's okay <laughs> it's awesome And at this point, I'm going to stop the recording.